I'm going to talk about the uh, technology uh, of, of uh, whether you want to call them unmanned aerial vehicles, remotely piloted aircraft, uh, or drones. Um, first, I want to say one thing in response to, to something Ben said, because I was covering the hearing in the Senate that he referenced. Um, and he said, we don't really know uh, where, under the authorization to use military force, the United States can use military action. I would argue that uh, we do, particularly we got that sort of stated explicitly uh, by uh, four administration uh, and military representatives, and the answer is Earth. It's battlefield Earth. Uh, this is not an exaggeration. It's something that uh, between Mike Sheehan, the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Low-Intensity Conflict and Special Operations, um, the top Pentagon lawyer, Robert Taylor, um, lawyers for the joint, uh, lawyer for the Joint Chiefs of Staff, um, and the uh, Special Operations Director on the Joint Staff made it clear that from their perspective, the battlefield is wherever, as, the, as, as one of the quotes went, the enemy goes. The enemy decides it is. Uh, Sheehan was asked, where particularly, you know, do you have the bounds of this authority to use military force and strike? And he went from Boston to the FATA, using an acronym for Pakistan's tribal areas. So uh, I, I remember very vividly after Rand Paul's filibuster, uh, when uh, the attorney general goes to testify and is asked, well, you know, can you really, you know, use military authority over someone meeting in a cafe who you suspect is a terrorist? And Holder goes, no, 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 you can't do that. Well, the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Special Operations and Low-Intensity Conflict said, yes, you can, that this is, if, if that, in fact, is where uh, an enemy defined very loosely under this exceptionally broad and very short law uh, manifests itself, then there are perhaps bureaucratic and strategy considerations uh, for not using military force, for using a law enforcement solution. I don't know why that's beeping, but whatever. Um, uh, but... There's nothing that stops them from doing that as a matter of law. So that's something to consider here. Um, so let's talk about uh, the technology behind uh, these flying robots of, of death. Um, there's kind of a meme out there about what drones are. Um, the idea is uh, these are things that uh, fly around without pilots uh, that spy on you according to algorithms that uh, determine uh, where and how they should spy on you for what duration, and then when they see a bad person, they kill them. And none of that is really true. Uh, the further you dig down in that, uh, you find that these are a bunch of either badly uh, articulated or just badly um, understood uh, observations. So what do I mean by that? Uh, the first thing is, don't think of the drone as the stuff it carries. Don't think of it as the sensor packages and the cameras that spy on, any, that spy on people, and don't think of it as the weapons they carry that strike people. Uh, all these things are, are airframes, and nearly all of them in use currently in the military. And uh, according to um, one study, uh, as of January 2012, one in every three U.S. Uh, warplanes, be that fixed wing uh, or be that uh, rotary wing like tilt rotors or ospreys or helicopters, uh, is a robot. Um, nearly all of these things, as they're used, have a pilot somewhere. Uh, whether that pilot is hundreds of miles away on places like uh, Bagram Airfield for the war in Afghanistan, or whether they're 7,000 miles away from where they're used at uh, places like Nellis and Creech Air Force bases. When you go into the cockpit, or what's called a ground control station, of a Predator uh, or uh, its, its bigger, badder cousin, the Reaper, what you see is something that's not totally unfamiliar um, to the history of, of manned aviation, you've got someone in the Air Force's case, it's an officer, in the Army's case, it's an enlisted warrant officer, um, the Navy hasn't really decided this stuff yet, um, sitting in a freezing cold, very refrigerated uh, box, usually with a contractor from the company that manufactures the airframe next to them, uh, dark with lots of computer screens where they do what looks a lot like um, IRC style uh, chatting next to one another um, and looking over, um, f uh, f connecting to their, their chains of command, littered with lots of energy drink cans around because they're on duty for something like between eight and in some cases 11 hours at a time. And what's next to them uh, is a throttle, is a stick, and they're physically controlling the aircraft in real time. They send it up in the air, they control where it loiters, 
they stay on station as long as that thing stays on station. And what that means is that we shouldn't think of these things as autonomous creatures. There's a human being controlling them. That increasingly is, in, is eroding somewhat. On Tuesday, uh, I was on the deck of the USS George H.W. Bush for something the Navy was super excited about, which was the launch of something called the X-47B. It's a demonstrator aircraft. The thing looks like a bat wing. There's no tail on it. Um, if anyone's a Battlestar Galactica fan, think of a Cylon Raider. Um, it kind of even has the, uh, the red visor um, it's, it's nuts. Uh, it's 62 feet in wingspan, so it's enormous. And unlike any drone before, it's capable of launching off an aircraft carrier, which is one of the hardest maneuvers in aviation. You're launching and then landing, which is the hardest maneuver in aviation, off of something that moves, that pitches, that rocks, that's affected by the weather, uh, that human beings on a deck have to be exceptionally careful about controlling. It's basically a robotic top gun. Um, it can't land on the thing on the deck yet. That's uh, they're going to do the first deck la landing in either like July or August. But um, it also differs from the predators and reapers that you've read a lot about, um, and the robotic helicopters you've read about. And another difference: everything I said about the ground control station, where a guy's in there and it has a throttle, it has a stick, and all that, doesn't apply uh, for the Navy's upcoming uh, drones, which they're calling eventually when this program with the X-47B expires, there's something called U-Class for Unmanned Carrier Launched Aerial Surveillance and Strike. Uh, instead of a human being physically controlling these things at all times, it's lines of code. Uh, you've got software programs that uh, basically through the miracle of algorithm and interaction with GPS uh, will program in a flight plan for the, the forthcoming U-Class, which should probably enter the Navy, they want somewhere between 2018 and 2020, and then the robot flies. And when you need it to come back down uh, to, the, uh, to, the, to the deck of the ship, you enter another program, and the, and the robot executes it. Um, what they're not doing, what no one in the military is envisioning right now, is autonomizing the decisions and the protocols for striking, for releasing a weapon. That's something that the military takes exceptionally seriously. That's something international law takes even more seriously. Um, you, is, it, is it technologically possible? You can always figure out a way to automate it. But like, when you think about it, you know, what's the most, uh, what, what's the weapon with the greatest degree of autonomy there is? A landmine. So, you know, when you think about uh, autonomy and, and drones, and particularly autonomy and weapons releases, a, this is something with, with a very long history in other uh, weapons technology, and B, as of right now, there's a determination uh, inside the military that that's crossing a Rubicon, and they don't, they don't want to do that. Will they do it at some point? Mm -hmm. um, more to the point, the history of the development of this weapons technology, um, as well as the development of really all civilian technology that we use all the time, is the encroachment of automation by very subtle degrees. Um, just you can see that in the difference between uh, the way that there is a remote pilot in a Predator and there isn't one for the X-47B and won't be one for its successor, the U-Class UK, the UK, the UK program. Um, so we've got that. Look at some of the things that uh, already right now, uh, in terms of a surveillance package, uh, these robots carry. One of the big reasons that you want these things, that the military wanted these things, uh, for the past ten for the past ten years, developed them for the last, you know, depending on where you want to count back since the '70s and put them into use in the in the late '90s and such, um, is because you know a human being. All of us here have physical needs uh, that don't really go very well with being in a plane for 24 hours at a time. Um, so basically, that's why uh, there was um, a military market uh, for these for these robots. And one of the things you can do with a robot that can stay aloft for far longer than, than a manned airplane can is you strap on its belly uh, sensors and cameras of increasing sophistication that can see ever more stuff. And the term the military likes to use for this is persistent surveillance. That is, it stays over a period of, you know, depending on, you know, some of them can go for as long as 36 hours, but that's a robot with really a lot of stamina, and most of them don't have that. Uh, to take a defined period over the ground and give 
uh, this persistence stare, or you get what will eventually be called pattern of life activity. Everyone below, you start to see who goes to the market and when, what's their pattern, what's their routine of going back uh, home, who they interact with, and you can basically drill down because these things, it's something between, you know, 10, f sometimes five to 10,000, sometimes as high as uh, 25 to 30,000 feet. Uh, the cameras are good enough that you can, you know, see down to people's faces fairly clearly, depending on, you know, cloud cover and such. Um, and what happens when you do that? When you have people's pattern of life activities, then you start looking for anomalies. And as the way uh, the drones have developed as, as a, as a uh, platform for using uh, missile strikes, uh, when something looks anonymous, uh, sorry, when something looks anomalous, you kill them. Um, and, and that's sort of what pattern of life activity is, is kind of giving you. Um, there are some really uh, almost hard to fathom uh, in their sophistication cameras that are being used on these things. Uh, one of them that uh, my friend here, Julian, is probably going to go into a little bit more uh, is something the Air Force developed with the funky name of Gorgon Stare. Uh, the idea behind Gorgon Stare is that uh, you can put this thing in something like a Reaper is probably on uh, the smaller end of, of, of the thing. Basically, it's, it's kind of a, a big series of, of, of megapixel cameras together. Um, I don't fully know, and I'm not sure if it's public, exactly how much you can see at once with this thing, but the Air Force likes to say you can see the size of a city all at once uh, when, you're, when you're on this, and all of the data is getting beamed down uh, to, to the ground control station where a human being has the uh, unfortunate job of analyzing all of that data. Very quickly, it becomes a big data problem for people familiar with that unfortunate buzzword. Um, that's not even... Uh, the thing that's coming on next is going to be uh, quite more intensive, something called Argus. Uh, people who may have seen a PBS Nova documentary recently about, about drone technology may be familiar with this. Um, it's a 1.8 gigapixel camera uh, with 92 5 megapixel imagers. Uh, that can give you, in one blink of a robotic eye, uh, an image of 36 square miles. It's absolutely enormous. It's not online yet. It will be soon. Um, it gets you something like six petabytes of data per day. Uh, you can think of that as if you're, if you're watching all of this at once, um, in one sitting, that's the daily equivalent of 79.8 years worth of HD video. Uh, so really an enormous data problem. Uh, there's an irony of drone surveillance, which is that uh, the human beings who have to put all of this stuff together into a picture are just absolutely drowning. Um, and one of the things that uh, the military's blue sky researchers at the Defense Advanced Pro uh, Research Projects Agency are trying to put together uh, is increasing automation in the cameras so that you can tag and filter imagery that a camera will pre-select for you and only give you the stuff that it thinks that you need to know about. Um, so there we've got uh, some of the capabilities of these things. Uh, what are their weaknesses? Um, among them, uh, these, are, if I, these are really terrible aircraft. They fly slow, uh, they can't maneuver, um, they certainly can't maneuver very well. Uh, a funny thing, uh, the, the engine uh, that was basically the, you know, used for a prototype of a Predator, uh, and still kind of to this day, uh, is the descendant of a snowmobile engine that was put together in someone's backyard, uh, someone's garage. Um, the engines aren't that great. Uh, the US is just starting to get on the cusp of, of uh, putting jet engines in these things. Um, the X-47B has, has a, a super Hornet engine, um, uh, which is a, a Navy plane, the F-A-18, which is a pretty, very capable plane with a very proven engine. Um, so what does that mean? You know, you notice where in the world does the U.S. use these things? Afghanistan, uh, Libya, after the initial um, decimation of Muammar Gaddafi's air defenses, uh, Pakistan, Somalia, Yemen, uh, what are you noticing about these things? These are countries that don't have sophisticated air defense systems. And that's basically because if you fired any kind of serious missile up at this thing, you just kill the robot. Um, there are some, some reasons why, you know, there's, there's a, I should say there's a debate in the military about the value of that. If you were to put them over uh, a country like China or North Korea or any place with defended airspace, well, at least you're not killing a human being but you are going to lose this airframe very quickly. Um, so the military, particularly the Navy and the Air Force, have this uh, kind of 
dense concept called anti-access area denial, or if you want to sound cool, you can use the acronym A2AD. What that means is lots of countries that want to keep you out from their airspace or off their shores invest in stuff like missiles, stuff like uh, cyber countermeasures um, that can you know, keep these things kind of far away from their shores. Um, the military is probably still not really looking uh, to use drones in those kinds of environments because you, you lose the airframe. Although, like I say, uh, there's a debate. Another countermeasure, um, there was, a, I believe, a, a Texas, polit um, a Texas uh, academic engineer who saw that for uh, a lot of the uh, drones used domestically in, in limited frames, I'll talk about some of those in a second, um, because they're GPS reliant, they're really easy to spoof. And it's very easy to get, uh, as, as, as we saw, well, as we think we saw when the Iranians uh, basically got uh, their hands on a really advanced stealth drone uh, called the RQ-170 Sentinel. It's also easy to get some malware into these things. And that's really uh, something uh, to think about um, as the automation of these systems uh, goes forward. Um, the X-47B that I mentioned, the drone that can launch off and you know, at some point land on an aircraft carrier, is extremely GPS reliant. That's a really big red flag, uh, particularly for those who are for interested in, in, in cybersecurity and countermeasures. Um, there's also the thing, you know, as, as a really easy countermeasure, um, with talk about uh, the drone market coming into the United States, uh, with Homeland Security and law enforcement starting to wade into buying these things, um, a really, you know, I think it's fair to say effective countermeasure. Uh, people have guns in their homes, um, and when they start to see robots circling overhead, inevitably, you know, those guns will be used on the robots. Um, I have a, a colleague who reports from Yemen um, who says that uh, some of his contacts are increasingly looking into to buying, um, you know, knockoff Chinese silkworms and like um, rockets and, and low-grade missiles that they will then aim at the drones. And, and when the U.S. starts seeing these things shot down over presumably undefended airspace, that's going to occasion quite a great deal of thought in the U.S. military. Um, so as I said, uh, and I'm going to wrap up with this, um, the drone budget in the United States military is declining. The military has basically said, with some airframe exceptions, they've bought as many of these as they need. Uh, so where does the drone market go next? It comes home. It comes to places like the United States. Um, a handful of cop shops have already gotten approval from the FAA uh, to start operating these things. It's occurs in a very limited way. None of them have been weaponized so far. Um, some of them uh, are also uh, the cheaper end. Uh, you, you see Homeland Security uh, buying some predators uh, to use over uh, the southern border for immigration purposes, and those things suck. Uh, they've crashed. Uh, there's the, the, the they haven't really mastered uh, the data links very well. Um, so there's, you know, trial and error on the civilian law enforcement and homeland security side that the military is, has, has already dealt with. Um, uh, if anyone here is an Empire Strikes Back fan, um, if you guys remember uh, the probe that the Empire sends to the ice planet of Hoth, uh, it looks like this kind of weird, funky bucket with these tendrils coming down. Um, the uh, Miami-Dade Police Department is using a drone that looks eerily like that. Um, the Army used it uh, in Iraq. Uh, troops like to call it the flying beer keg because that's kind of what it looks like. Um, it's got some rudimentary sensors. Uh, the idea is uh, cop shops will use that if you've got like a hostage scenario. Um, put that over the building um, that uh, the bad guys are taking the hostages in um, so you can get a better sense from, from an aerial overhead view without having to spool up a big helicopter that can alert people uh, to where, you know, what exits might be defended if people are getting out, if there's access to weapons and so forth coming in the back. So that's one thing. No one's talking about, and the FAA says that they will not allow uh, weaponized drones uh, for civilian law enforcement. But this is really the thing to watch. Um, in 2015, the FAA is committed to vastly opening up uh, its licensing uh, for the use of unmanned aerial vehicles in U.S. airspace. Uh, this is something that uh, Naturally, uh, drone manufacturers have a lobby. It's called AUVSI. They're really, really into pushing uh, the rapid acceleration of these drone licensing uh, issues. This is a, a big and live issue on Congress. They come uh, to buildings like this uh, every couple weeks. It's something uh, to really pay a lot of attention to.